Hi, Erica. Thanks for coming and presenting. Hello. Hi, everybody. Okay, so let's get started. Um, today, we have Erica Anderson giving us an update on the dosage sensitivity working group. Um, some announcements, ClinGen will be at ASHG, we'll have a booth and we have a couple different events going on. Um, and this URL will point you towards those events. I should say, just be on the lookout. Um, we really would like to celebrate the biocurators because this is the 10 year anniversary of ClinGen and we're nothing without the biocurators. So we'll be having a ClinGen lunch, which is RSVP only. Um, I'm going to try to send that out specifically to the BioCurator working group when we have the RSVP link and the agenda formalized. Um, so be on the lookout for that and do, if you are attending ASHG this year, not um, wait to register because we have a cap in registrations. Um, we'll also be having an evening reception hosted um, by Illumina and the Medical Genome Initiative. Um, so more to come, both of those are RSVP. So keep an eye out um, and take a look at the ClinGen ASHG events. It also has a list of um, posters and talks from ClinGen groups um, at ASHG. And the next meeting is on, on October 26th at noon Eastern, and we'll have gene curation SOP updates, and then also continue the variant curation um, question and answer session. And thanks for sticking the um, URL in the chat, Alicia, for the ASHG events. So I think with that, um, I will turn it over to Erica. And so um, Erica is an associate professor of clinical pathology at the University of Utah, and she's also the laboratory section chief of the cytogenetics and genomic microarray labs at ARIP. Um, and we look forward to hearing about the dosage sensitivity curation. Hey, <clears throat> thanks, Marina. Um, can everybody see my screen, the one that I'm actually trying to present on here? Looks good. Looks good, okay. All right, let me just scoot some stuff over. Okay, well, um, and thank you for that introduction. Um, I'm happy to be here to provide updates on behalf of the ClinGen Dosage Sensitivity Curation Working Group. Um, and mainly I will be um, providing updates on behalf of each of our subgroups, um, some more comprehensive um, updates that we've been doing um, related to the public site and um, and then again getting into what each of our subgroups has been working on um, since the last time I think I presented in a in a large ClinGen forum was in 2020. I, I looked back over the past couple of years um, to pull in information for this presentation. Okay. So just a little bit of background um, for those of you who might be um, maybe not as familiar with what we do in dosage sensitivity. We asked this main question, um, does loss or gain of a copy of either a gene or a genomic region um, result in a, a constitutional disease? Um, and, um, and this is the the main question, you can go to our um, our page there that I have linked down at the bottom um, and learn a little bit more about the details about what we do. We have a lot of really helpful information um, for those of you that may not be accessing our site every day. But um, with that, I'll, I'll get into um, obviously more detail about how we do that, but I thought it'd be helpful just to um, provide a little bit of background um, in the history of this working group. This is actually one of the um, original ClinGen um, working groups that formed around 2015. Actually, prior to this, we were known as the International Standards of Cytogenomic Microarrays Consortium um, here on the left. And um, around 2011 is actually when um, Aaron Riggs, um, Krista Martin and um, Eric Thorland, several other uh, original working group members put together um, uh, the, the outline of our curation process that really persisted all the way through 2019. And I'll talk a little bit about um, how we're doing things today. Um, but um, originally we were known as the ISEA and then um, formed a ClinGen working group around 2015. And I wanted to highlight a couple of the projects that um, we uh, 
worked on during that time, in addition to all of the genes that were curated for dosage. Um, one was um, looking at select low penetrance recurrent CNVs. I think the working group realized at the time that um, clinical labs were doing a lot of genomic microarray analysis um, and encountering some of this uh, literature that it, it could be um, challenging to uh, get consensus in the community. So one of the um, efforts of the working group um, early on even was was actually to release um, expert curations um, for gene uh, for region dosage on some select uh, low penetrance CNBs and that really paved the way for um, one of the subgroups that, that I'm a co-chair of uh, working on recurrent CNBs you'll hear about a little later. An another big project that we had um, several years ago was um, when the ACMG 56 list, the, the original secondary findings genes list first was published. Um, our group took that list and also um, applied the dosage scoring um, metrics to those genes to um, make sure that um, folks who were, you know, running routine CN, clinical CNV analysis were aware of these genes and which genes to, um, um, you know, to be alerted of. Um, so that also kind of paved the way, the way for the hereditary cancer genes um, working group. So around 2017, we actually underwent a restructuring. We split into three different subgroups, and those are listed here. Um, up until uh, just this year, we're just going to call these the genes and regions working groups, I think, going forward. But there was a, a focus on um, a number of uh, novel um, neurodevelopmental genes that had not been previously curated and trying to get those um, up onto the public site. And that effort was um, led by Aaron Riggs, um, Eric Thorland, and Krista Martin's team. And then uh, we also formed a recurrent CNVs working group. That's the one that I'm a co-chair of currently with um, John Harrigus. And we are focused on um, primarily these low penetrance CNVs, but we've we've basically provided curations for um, all of the segdup mediated regions across the genomes, or at least we have them annotated in Q to, um, to curate those and provide updated information. And then um, just a year later in 2019, the Hereditary Cancer Genes Group formed. And I think this was just um, an effort to try to um, focus on areas that we knew clinically um, um, labs and clinicians were wanting to get more information on. So that's, that's really what I'm gonna be covering today. Um, and this slide, this is kind of an old slide, but it's still a good one that just kind of goes through the um, the the basic curation process that we use. It has obviously been updated and refined, um, especially recently with the use of points-based metrics. Um, but we still follow this kind of um, general um, uh, uh algorithm for moving through um, and, and coming up with, uh, moving through evidence and, and coming up with finalized um, scores. So um, where we get our information from is primarily from peer reviewed literature. We do access some um, clinical databases, um, but the primary source of information used for dose and sensitivity curation is the literature. Um, we from, from those lit reviews, we, um, we evaluate um, strengths of evidence. We're looking at total number of probands and families if a, a particular CNV is segregating. Um, so we look at things like inheritance, um, specificity of the phenotype. And of course, um, we are evaluating different variant types that may um, correspond to a dosage effect on a particular gene, um, especially. Um, and then, oh, and then um, as a result of all of that evidence curation, um, a curator will assign a rating, um, and that rating uh, ranges from three to zero, three being the highest, um, for both the um, copy number loss of a gene or region, so that is the haploinsufficiency score, and a copy number gain, which would be a triple O sensitivity score. Um, here we're scoring for duplications. And um, that those ratings and reviews are brought to the um, individual subgroups. Now it used to be the, the whole working group. And um, once we have consensus amongst the working group, those, are, those reviews are finalized and published on our public website.
So um, this slide illustrates the types of variants that um, we typically encounter during a haploinsufficiency efficiency evaluation. Um, if we're tasked to evaluate the potential of uh, the potential haploinsufficiency of say gene B up here, our primary goal is really to identify um, gene deletions um, that are isolated to or focal to a particular gene. Um, however, as the breakpoints of these types of events are often variable, we may encounter deletions that either um, partially overlap a gene or encompass a gene in additional sequence. Um, and then we're, we're also accounting for um, sequence variants that would result in a loss of function, um, similar uh, functional effect as a, a gene deletion in uh, a haploinsufficiency evaluation. Um, other variants that we may encounter and, and often do encounter include um, larger deletion and duplication events. Um, typically, these will get routed to the regions team if um, they're um, exhibiting a recurrent effect, um, have, say, a minimally deleted region that might be important for us to document that we want people to know about. Um, so you will encounter those as you, you know, curate gene level evidence, but these are not used um, to score for a particular gene. It really has to be variants that are focal to that gene. Um, and then if, and then I think this will probably come into play more as we move forward into um, doing uh, testing like whole genome uh, analysis where you're able to get structural information. Um, if you have a balance rearrangement with a breakpoint in a gene, um, we are um, we are typically documenting those. Um, they're not very frequent, but we do run across them um, occasionally. And sometimes with, in the context of a very specific phenotype, you, you can actually um, find that information to be valuable in supporting a gene's potential haploinsufficiency. Um, we also um, do curate, um, although not to um, the same, I would say, stringency that we do for um, for uh, hemizygous um, deletions. We we curate evidence for autosomal recessive risk. So um, here we're looking at genes that have a known um, recessive disease association through biallelic um, loss of function. So you can either have two copy deletions or a deletion um, in combination with a, a, a sequence variant or sometimes multiple sequence variants that result in loss of function. Okay. Um, for uh, the triplosensitivity evaluation, here we are a bit more restrictive in terms of the types of variants that we can include as supported evidence for a gene's dose of sensitivity. Here, it's really only copy number gains that are isolated to gene B in this example here um, that result in a whole gene duplication. So any other event that intersects this gene that includes either um, additional gene content or a breakpoint within the gene, these types of events do not count for triplosensitivity. Um, and this is one of the re reasons that um, any users of our um, of our um, curations will know that we don't have that many genes um, across the genome that are actually scored triplosensitive um, three score because it's it's actually hard to observe these events. Um, they don't always occur in this perfect way. Um, so um, for, for a, a partial gene duplication, actually these can disrupt a gene's function. We may document these types of events in a haploid sufficiency evaluation. Oftentimes we're looking at non-focals and we can document them and then create a region um, to account for those scenarios. Then every once in a while we do run across biallelic or um, high copy gain um, type of events that we, we also may document. Okay, um, so this is a summary of the dose sensitivity rating system um, that I mentioned before. Um, this is uh, ranges from a three to zero um, in terms of strengths of evidence. So the highest strength of evidence is sufficient in that 
um, does by and large actually correspond to pathogenic clinical classification in the um, current CNV interpretation guidelines. So this is important to keep in mind. Um, same goes for this category, the dose and sensitivity unlikely category, um, which is used to classify genes and um, variants as benign. Um, so anything that um, is encountered in the dose and sensitivity curation website that has one of these two, these two classifications is generally um, allowed to be sort of auto classified within the CNB interpretation um, structure. So, um, so we do keep that in mind as we are um, evaluating genes and regions and making sure that um, we have good stringent criteria for binning them into those two categories. Um, in between is the zero to two um, uh, rankings of evidence. Um, zero corresponds to usually none or insufficient. Sometimes we have conflicting evidence um, that goes into that category, and that's usually categorized as likely benign or uncertain. Um, one corresponds to little or limited evidence. It's usually corresponds to a clinical BUS type of, of classification. If you think about how these scores will align with clinical classifications. And then um, the two score um, uh, is used for um, uh, usually emerging evidence. It tends to be those um, genes and regions that are leaning towards um, becoming uh, a true dosage sensitive um, gene or region. And so uh, the potential clinical classification that I think we're going to be leaning towards um, is, is likely pathogenic, but some of these may be kind of that high level uncertain category if you encounter a CNV that involves that gene. And that's really how, how people use the scores. And then we have this autosomal recessive category down here. Um, so I pulled some statistics from um, the website, actually, um, and a lot of development has been done, um, not just for our group, but for other curation groups um, within the ClinGen um, public page. So again, take a look, go take a look at, um, you know, each of the groups. But if you want to take a look at dosage sensitivity, um, our statistics show that we have a total of... Um, 3,836 total curations that are in there. I think we are the highest um, number um, of uh, curations per group. And um, that reflects probably both our historical, um, the amount of time that we've been um, you know, doing this, but also um, a lot of work that's been done to um, both manually and um, automate certain um, curations that we've been able to put in. So that accounts for about 1,500 genes and um, 500 regions, actually. Not all of these are, um, actually only a small subset of these are considered to be clinically significant, but we've managed to um, put a lot of known benign regions in there as well that can be just as helpful. Okay. I do see a question here, and I'm wondering if it would be good for me to keep going or stop, but the question is, does likely path equate to about 90% posterior probability of disease causing like the SNV um, system? Um, what I can tell you is that, um, no, it's not a dumb question, Kristen. Um, and hopefully you guys can all see the chat. Um, it's, it's a good question. And it's one that we've actually been working on both in dose sensitivity and in the, um, the CNV interpretation um, guidelines working group that I'm also a part of. Uh, but this is why I mentioned that I think just to align with what other um, groups are doing is that we are trying to um, move towards a system where our point system does correspond to um, both those probability estimates as well as, you know, sort of how um, uh, folks in the field consider um, the two scores to be uh, or likely pathogenic to be more of a leaning towards pathogenic type of categorization than somewhere in the middle. Um, so I know that, um, you know, within each of the individual subgroups, um, all of us are working on this and trying to um, apply um, those rules. 
Um, but it may be slightly different in the next couple of years as we wait for updated sequence variant interpretation guidelines, as well as an update to copy number variants. But I imagine in the future, this will all be um, the same. So hopefully that answers that question. Um, so as you can see, um, in terms of the, and I was kind of alluding to this earlier, in terms of the sheer number of, um, you know, genes and variants, uh, CNV regions that we have um, classified, um, there are far fewer that are categorized as the dosage three score, the sufficient evidence score for um, triplosensitivity than there are for haploinsufficiency. And I think that also just reflects the biology of the genome. Um, so, um, uh, but we we have quite a few um, genes in here that have been added, especially over the past three years. Um, I think we were closer to a thousand total genes back in 2000. So a lot of efforts been done to um, to add to these different um, categories. Um, and I wanted to, to provide some updates about um, what's been done on the um, the public site and also our internal curation interface website. Um, a large effort um, was made to migrate our old website um, into the ClinGen curation interface um, and support um, all of the different evidence categories that we're currently utilizing and documenting within um, back in around 2020. So um, since then, we, um, we've we been utilizing the new DCI website. Um, the genes group has developed an SOP. Our regions group also has an SOP, although I didn't see it was published on the site. So I need to make sure we get that um, finalized and uploaded soon. Um, and uh, those documents outline just the whole curation process, both for internal curators as well as um, users of the, um, the website, but primarily for those folks who are actually gonna be involved in curation. Um, and it's, it's really great to have um, new SOPs um, and, and a new interface that has support and new development. And I think what you'll see in the future is more um, uh, uh, public facing um, information in terms of the metrics that are being um, used and developed right now, similar to what you see with gene disease validity and other, um, other public curation sites. Um, but some some accomplishments. So we are now displaying region curations. Previously, um, you could only view single genes on the website. Um, and um, you can also search by genomic coordinates. That was actually a, a big um, feature to have developed for our um, users of especially our site because a lot of folks do search by um, a CNV's coordinates to find information about gene content and region content within those. So this is the most common search that um, dosage map users um, will perform. And then um, we also have, um, as I mentioned, we have a customized internal website, that's the DCI, the dosage curation interface that um, has um, special fields to capture gene and region specific information that we're currently curating. Um, so the, all of that was built over the past couple of years and um, future plans, and these may already be in the works um, with um, between Aaron Riggs and um, Phil, her developer, um, uh, to um, implement versioning and history of major, major and minor updates uh, within curation so that when a user comes to the public site, they can see, okay, this gene was updated recently, what type of a change was it? Um, and that will just make, um, you know, the information that we're, we're um, kind of managing internally to be more um, easily understandable and visible to our users. So a lot of thought into you know, how people are using the website and what they want to see when they come here. And so I took a screenshot of just um, a search that I did earlier today, just to kind of show you um, some of the new features for those of you that maybe don't use this all the time, you can turn a toggle um, to look at just genes, just regions or both. Um, you can search in here by entering your genomic coordinates. Um, here, I just actually, and then there's all sorts of um, 
sorry, there's summary statistics up at the top so that you can see, you know, what, what our totals are looking like, but there's all sorts of customization that you can build into your search. Um, and um, here I just searched by the haploid sufficiency score. So I, if I, you wanted to go search for all the three score genes and then, you know, sort by which ones were just updated recently. These were actually um, updated, uh, looks like yesterday. So um, so we have two new genes that were, um, you know, just curated and closed out yesterday. And then here you see this, um, hopefully you guys can see my cursor and on the third line down for PHF 21A, um, there is a highlight over this three score for sufficient evidence. If you were to click on that, it would tell you that that, um, that score was recently updated. And so those are the types of things that we want to be able to provide to users when they come um, to, to the site. Um, in addition, we're able to pull in, you know, other information from other resources like OMAM and um, the um, haploid sufficiency predictors that um, we can talk about a little later. So a lot of really nice new features available to users on the, the public site, thanks to all that development work. Um, so these are the, the three subgroups um, for dosage sensitivity. And um, we have uh, on the left here is the genes group, it currently has 44 members. They've done a lot of work to increase their membership over the past couple of years to try to increase the number of genes um, that they're able to um, uh, review and close out. Co-chairs are Krista Martin, Aaron Riggs, and Eric Thorland, and coordinated by Madison Brown. They actually have two working groups that meet um, once a month. They have their Tuesday group and the Wednesday group, and those are split about 50-50 just based on what people's schedules are. And um, they have historically, you know, as I mentioned, focused on neurodevelopmental genes, but basically any genes that kind of fall outside of um, hereditary cancer, they are currently curating and tackling right now. Um, and um, we'll talk a little bit more about them next. Uh, the region subgroup um, has 14 current members. This will uh, be increasing soon. Um, that's uh, me uh, and John Hargis as co-chairs of that group coordinated by Zoe Lewis, and we meet weekly. The reason we're meeting weekly right now is because we have, um, we're making a big push to get a manuscript finished up this year. Um, and get a bunch of region curations um, pushed out that have just needed to be updated for quite some time. So it just requires us to get the group together more frequently. And um, we have primarily focused on those recurrent CNVs, the SegDupe mediated um, CNVs that hopefully if you work in this space, you know exactly what these are, um, but I'll talk about those. Um, but we are also going to be starting to work on non-recurrence, so um, variable breakpoint region curation. This is going to be an effort that's starting up soon, um, and we'll be um, recruiting volunteers to help work on that, particularly folks who have um, expertise um, in um, large CNV event curation and thinking about genotype phenotype. Um, and and looking at minimally deleted or duplicated, um, you know, regions from literature, trying to come up with curation so that we have a nice map of annotations that our users can access. Um, some of these are actually outside of even outside of coding regions of the genome, so it's going to um, encompass basically anything that's non non segdu mediated is the goal of that project. Um, and then for hereditary cancer, um, this subgroup has 22 current members. The chair is McKinsey Goodenberger, coordinated by Madison Brown, and they are meeting once a month. Um, they are looking at um, constitutional um, dose sensitivity of genes that are associated with increased risk for cancer. Um, and I need to turn off my teams. Okay. Right. I'm back in here. All right, so um, first update is from the general gene dosage subgroup. Um, you can see their large membership here. Um, it's great to have so many curators participating in this effort. And I know that um, they're always recruiting for more 
um, volunteers to help out. So um, I did mention this earlier that um, one of the big accomplishments of this group was to um, incorporate the CNV interpretation guidelines metrics into their own curation um, scoring system. So to start applying a uh, points-based metric uh, for gene curation that is largely based on um, the framework that was um, published in the ACMG ClinGen um, technical standards um, that came out in actually late 2019, but published in, in 2020. So um, knowing that this was coming, the group actually got a little bit ahead of that work and started in February of 2019. Um, to utilize that process for single gene evaluations. And prior to this, they've been using the, the original um, framework that was based on counting probands. Um, so I, I did sort of mention this as well, that the Within the technical standards, the, the technical standards do highlight that the ClinGen dosage sensitivity map um, specifically annotates and scores genes and regions um, in relation to um, dosage sensitivity and should be used, uh, the recommendation was that it should be used to interrogate most CMVs. Um, so what constitutes established um, dosage sensitive or benign um, is really um, based on these two um, categories in the metric. So um, if you have uh, in 2A um, a complete overlap with an established dosage sensitive gene or genomic region, so anything that's three scored, um, you can actually apply the max points um, in the current um, clinical CNV interpretation metrics. Same goes for the other direction with established benign. Um, so the idea was that if ClinGen dosage sensitivity is curated, it you can essentially apply those clinical classifications to those two categories. So this is the new genes uh, dosage sensitivity curation metric. It is based on section four of the um, CMV interpretation guidelines. So anybody who's familiar with this will recognize this right away. Um, currently, the group is um, is still using the um, the negative one to one points based system, um, and um, evaluating information including the inheritance pattern, the specificity of the phenotype, whether it's um, you know unique to a gene, um, and and assigning points based on all of the evidence that they find um, for probands from um, the literature. And then for uh, recurrent CNV curation, this is um, a working group that I co-chair with um, John Harrigus. I can talk a little bit about more what we've been working on. Um, <clears throat> so as I mentioned, um, our, our work really started in this subgroup formation around 2019 is when we formed 2018, 2019. Our goals were to develop a new metric for recurrent CNV curation. We have that, um, almost completely finalized now um, and all of the evidence categories that we are planning to um, include are in that metric now. Um, some new ones um, that are kind of specific to recurrent CNVs I'll, I'll go through. Um, we also wanted to create annotation files to assist users. I'll show you an example of what that looks like um, so that people know where these regions of the genome are. Some of them have really complex or complicated um, naming. And so it can lead to confusion when um, uh, users go to the literature and um, are, are searching by chromosomal band name um, to be able to um, you know, standardize the, the naming and um, the positioning of each of these regions. Um, and then currently we're working on this last piece here, um, refining the metric and completing reviews and updates that has actually been the large bulk of the work here is to get our our uh, reviews finished. Um, they can be quite extensive for certain regions. There's a lot of literature to go through and document. 
Um, so that's really what we've been focusing on over the past um, couple of years. Uh, we did submit a concept sheet for our manuscript that was actually recently approved. So we are going to be moving forward, trying to get that done by um, this winter is our goal. So um, I mentioned that if you go to the, um, the dosage site, you can find actually the list of all of the recurrent CNVs that are annotated and going to be reviewed as a part of this particular project. We have we had a nice um, whole number of 50, but then we added one to it. So now we have 51 total regions that are included in this list. Um, and um, you can see that um, uh, many of these are closed out. We're still holding on a few, and some of them may be um, in the midst of being updated, um, including, for example, this top one here, TAR syndrome. I know that's one that we're going to be updated, updating soon. So a lot of these, um, a lot of the curations in here will, um, you'll see over in the coming months, will um, reflect uh, the work that's been done, especially over the past um, year. And this is a screenshot of uh, one of our annotation files, I think probably our nicest one that we have for the regions work um, that you can find if you just go to the downloads page on the ClinGen website. Um, this was developed by um, John Harrigus and um, several others that were originally um, uh, this is a f internal file at ARUP where I work um, that we um, merged with um, a couple of other um, resources that um, uh, we pulled together several years ago to put this file together. So the orange regions reflect um, unique sequence and the black reflect um, positions of segmental duplications. This is, I think, the most complicated region in the genome, proximal 22Q where you can have um, a large number of different types of events occurring that create uh, deletions and duplications that you may encounter um, through um, you know, clinical or research testing. Um, so we just wanted to have all of these different regions annotated and um, they may not all individually have a, um, a actual curation for them, but if they're, because um, some of these have similar phenotypes, if you know, uh, multiple regions overlapping each other are involved in a particular event. But for the most part, we've really tried to tease these out and create individual annotations where it's appropriate to do so. Um, I guess the best example of overlapping ones that I can provide would be like the A to B and A to D regions involving the critical region for DeGeorge syndrome. Um, we do have separate regions for those, uh, but they um, link to one another. Okay, and then this is our just a preview of the uh, curation metric for the recurrent CNVs. Um, within this metric, I think many of you will recognize different sections that exist in other curation metrics, um, and then some that are maybe a little bit unique. Um, we have a our points based system is um, does correspond to the the dose sensitivity scores. But you can see that the ranges are um, are quite different um, from the existing um, CMV interpretation guidelines. Um, we are, um, we actually based the original version of this on, I think, gene disease validity. Um, but at the time um, we started building this, this is also during the time that we knew that the CMV interpretation metrics were going to be um, coming out. Um, we did stick to a you know whole number based point system. Um, whether um, in maybe the second version of this that will inevitably you know need to come out later on, um, we'll need to adjust points ranges. I think remains. Um, to be determined, but um, so far, what I can say is that um, these points largely correspond to um, historical and or consensus scoring um, after we work a region through the metric. Um, so on the left-hand side, we have genes within the CNV. We are um, looking at whether uh, established haploid sufficient or triple sensitivity gene is um, overlapped if it's focal and recessive to a 
uh, or if it's if it's involving a recessive gene and it's focal to just that gene or region, we do have an evidence category. There are a few regions like that um, in our um, set of regions. Then we can classify that as AR risk. If it's established, it gets to a max point. Um, gene count, this is taken directly from the CNV interpretation guidelines. Um, we're counting the number of protein coding genes and assigning points based on that. I don't have all the details here, but happy to answer any questions if people have them. And then we are looking at HI predictors. Um, we have chosen to require, with the recent um, uh, publication of the P-haplopre-triplo um, predictor system, we um, evaluated those as part of our project and are currently using both to assign a point or not to a particular region. Um, phenotype, um, this is very similar to the way that um, phenotype is um, evaluated in other, um, other schema. We look at whether it's a specific or non-specific type of phenotype and give uh, points values and ranges within those from zero to five. Uh, we also have this new category that um, we're calling the subclinical category. It's where um, when control carriers have been um, studied from the general population and determined to have a measurable and consistent difference um, in mainly neurocognitive um, measurements that can be taken. And there are a couple of papers that we are specifically including in that evidence category. This is really to try to account for these um, maybe small effect size, but, um, you know, consistent um, effects of certain CNVs, particularly the low penetrance ones on um, phenotypes that one would expect to encounter in the, um, in the uh, clinical population. Um, and then inheritance and segregation is another category that we are um, including here. If the CNV is most often de novo, we will assign four points or a range of three to five um, inherited um, from an affected parent. Or if it segregates, we are currently assigning points of one to two here. Um, if it's unknown or often inherited, but parental phenotypes are unknown. Actually, we use this category quite a bit when encountering the CNV, the current CNV literature. We do not assign any points for those scenarios. And then we do have um, a couple of CNVs that we've encountered where actually that particular variant is often inherited. It's often from a parent who doesn't have a measurable phenotype. It doesn't segregate in the family. And so for those scenarios, we are able to deduct points. Um, and then finally, another category that we use um, routinely is looking at case control data. Um, it is available for these regions because they all have recurrent breakpoints. So that's one of the um, one of the kind of differences between looking at these copy number variants and others is that we do have case control information. And here we've um, taken a, a guidance from one of our working group members, Brad Coe, who published um, along with um, Evan Eichler's team um, the some of the original case control data for CNVs um, that are still actually quite valuable to this day. Um, and so we're assigning points based on both p-value and effect size, um, based primarily on that publication. And then um, frequent CNVs that are high frequency and controls, we do, again, have a category where we can deduct points if it's a highly frequent um, variant, generally above 0.1 or 1% to uh, deduct points here, similar to how it is in the clinical um, CNV interpretation metrics. And so I have some examples here that I took through a couple of weeks ago. Um, I mean, we'd, we'd had these already categorized, but I, I pulled these in to give you an example of, uh, you know, a, a variant probably everybody recognizes the DeGeorge deletion and how we scored this um, or how one would score this if you didn't already know that it was pathogenic. Um, just to give you a feel for what um, you know, each of these evidence categories scores and as based on the available information. 
So um, in total, DeGeorge would get us up to 16 points, which based on this points range does correspond to a three score. So sometimes we're actually using these well-established um, and um, syndromic regions to help us kind of baseline different evidence categories and make sure that they're all represented in, um, in the metrics. And then to the right, this is an example of a more rare variant um, but happens to have this gene TMEM127 um, that was um, relatively recently curated and determined to be haploinsufficient. sufficient. So that kind of gets it to an auto uh, three score. So um, if it has a gene, if it, that encompasses that's already curated, that's where it goes, but we still take it through the, um, the rest of the evidence um, scoring to evaluate, um, particularly for any, you know, with this gene, it's um, predisposition for um, certain tumors. Um, we would want to consider what information was available for um, neurodevelopmental features as well and other phenotypes that have been um, reported in these patients. And since it's a rare variant, there's not a lot known, um, not, not a lot of observations from case control data, um, but this one was an example of one that we had previously had scored as a one based on inclusion of this gene, it gets to a max. So uh, auto three score for that gene. And then I have some more examples of um, variants that I think will start to um, again, if you do see NV interpretation, you're going to want to know about BP1, BP2. This is the one that everybody asked us about and how we got to the scores that we did for this particular um, variant. Um, this was actually based on this new category um, that I mentioned earlier of um, the subclinical phenotypes. Um, and so I encourage everybody to go to the review for this region if you want to um, see the very lengthy, comprehensive um, evaluation of this deletion, um, as well as the explanation for um, the scoring here. Um, but there is some case control data, um, but by and large within the clinical population, there's not really good evidence that um, this variant is having a uh, measurable effect. So um, I think this is something potentially we could talk about is um, in, in a suggestion that not only our working group members, but um, external, you know, uh, uh, audience uh, attendees who have expertise in this area have suggested that maybe we could have a three score that corresponds to um, kind of a, a low penetrance um, categorization and be able to include this information into uh, the public site so that when users come to the site, um, they can actually um, distinguish between variants that are high penetrance pathogenic and low penetrance uh, risk factors, those types of things, whatever your preferred terminology is. Um, and then we have a couple of, you know, other just, I, I threw in a couple other duplication regions that um, we actually ended up subtracting points for based on, you know, some of these other categories, just so you can see um, inheritance and segregation and um, high frequency of some of these events that are considered to be benign. Okay. So this is our progress report. As of um, last month, um, we have 42 uh, regions that are, uh, I should say variants, because this may be a deletion or a duplication that are completed and scored as a three score. Um, we have 19 as two, 20 as a one, and uh, 15 as zero. We also have um, six that are um, currently categorized as dosage sensitivity, unlikely, you don't expect that to change and two regions that are actually, we utilize that autosomal recessive category. Um, so one of the last things that we need to do is just refine um, a couple of um, sections of our metrics, including that last um, subclinical uh, phenotype section that we wanna make sure we're applying consistently across. But this was a, a, a figure that Brad Co put together for us several years ago. This is not up to date, but I just like to show it because it kind of shows the, um, it shows the um, where all of the regions that were scored at that time are sort of bidding out as, and so you don't, 
have a lot of um, overlap between these two categories. And so I think that demonstrates, um, you know, it showed us which, which regions we might want to take a look at and also demonstrates that um, our scoring system is, um, is able to, um, you know, pull out each of the different um, evidence categories and not have a lot of overlap. Okay, so for that project, um, our plans are to finalize and update um, those sections that are not ready for the public site. Uh, we have a paper coming and um, next up, we there will be an expert panel um, forming after the publication, which the goal of which is to actually assign consensus clinical classifications. This is what our community really wants and needs. And um, the goal will be to submit those to ClinVar um, and have sort of an expert curation for each individual variant once the framework is published. Okay, so moving on, um, one last group to cover here is the hereditary cancer gene subgroup. And um, I mentioned before, this, this effort really started when the, um, the original secondary findings list came out. And you can see, I just highlighted up at the top here, the number of genes that were categorized as hereditary cancer related that were also scored um, as a sufficient or, um, or, um, or likely um, uh, or two score category um, is very high on that list. So I think this showed us that we really wanted to start to bring in hereditary cancer genes as part of the curations and make sure that um, people are aware that if you have a deletion, particularly of many of these genes, it does confer um, that risk to um, developing um, cancer. So this is that team um, of curators led by McKinsey Gutenberger. And um, they started meeting in February 20, 2019, kind of went through this already. They had an original list of 205 genes. So far, they've actually made it almost three quarters of the way through their list. Um, so I think that that's a really great effort from this team. Um, they have, um, they have in, back when we pulled this together the first time, it was 29 genes. So they've done almost 100 since then. Um, so three score genes, there are 62, still a really high number of, um, you know, known haploinsufficient genes in that list. Um, but there are some other ones that are kind of binning out in these lower numbers now, and maybe those were ones that really needed to be evaluated for um, gene dosage. And I think in either direction, it's important to know if a gene is or is not um, capable of conferring cancer predisposition. That's important for people to know. Um, and there are a number of autosomal recessive genes also included in that list. Um, for triplo score, this is not really surprising. Um, most have a zero or um, uh, unlikely, or they just haven't been evaluated, but not necessarily expected that there will be um, a lot of genes in that category. And so I just actually pulled this from the public site um, yesterday just to highlight one of the genes that this group recently, um, you know, in the past year closed out. This is GATA2. It's a relatively novel um, MDS and AML predisposing um, uh, gene when deleted or um, affected by pathogenic loss of function variants. There are um, different types of variants that can affect this gene, but certainly if you encounter a complete loss of function, it's important to know about in a relatively novel um, condition. Um, Oops, okay, and then I've reached the end here. So I just wanted to thank um, the rest of the leadership team and admins who have helped out on all these various projects over the past couple of years. Um, I think I've mentioned everybody except for Brianna, who was one of the admins who just um, finished up with, um, with us recently and was working closely with Aaron. These are a couple of our highlighted publications, and I don't even have close to everybody's pictures up here. I need to get this slide updated, but I'll stop here and see if there's any questions. Great. Thanks so much, Erica. That was just such a comprehensive review of um, just so much progress from the dosage team, and um, just nice to hear about all the different subgroups. Um, does anyone have any questions? Feel free to unmute and ask them or stick them in the chat. 
in the meantime, I can ask one. I know this has come up on some of my VSEPs or my GSEPs re recently. Have you guys collaborated with GSEPs at all where, you know, we've evaluated some genes and realized, you know, a lot of the things that have been reported in the literature have been like deletions or duplications that are not just the gene, it's like a, a much larger region. So have you guys collaborated with GSEPs at all or, you know, accepted um, nominations from GSEPs for particular genes or areas? As far as I know, and, you know, Erin, if she was here, could probably speak more to that. But I think I still think that we're a little bit siloed um, in between what our groups are doing. I know I know that they do um, reference and review what's there if there already is a curation available for it for a particular gene. Certainly, we have not been looking at that information for regions. So if there are regions that are coming up, I mean, I I, we welcome um, any suggestions for, um, you know, important genes and regions that should be included in dosage curation. Um, and, and I think that it's, again, it's helpful. There's still a lot of labs, including my own, that, you know, do a lot of microarray work and you, you need to know, you know, where those mm -hmm. uh, genes are that are uh, primarily hit by DELs and DUPES. So, um, you know, they might the information might, might not carry over um, into dosage that should. So I think great. Be that's helpful. helpful. Yeah, I have encouraged people to reach out. So yeah. um, that's great. Any other questions? Okay, if no one has any questions, thanks again for coming, Erica, and giving us this sure. overview. And we will see everyone in a couple weeks. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye.